a bizarre turn today for a Trump lawyer named John Eastman. Um, he's an obscure figure who got famous through this whole scandal when he wrote the notorious Eastman memo, which laid out the theory of the case basically behind the January 6th attack on the Capitol. What Trump demanded of the crowd at that rally January 6th, right before his supporters rushed to the Capitol, what, what Trump demanded of them, what people like Eastman himself and other speakers that day told the mob they would accomplish if they, in Trump's words, fought like hell that day, was a specific thing. It was this scenario that was laid out in Eastman's memo in which he said Vice President Mike Pence shouldn't accept the electors from swing states that Biden won. The memo laid out how Vice President Mike Pence had the right not to accept those electors. And that's how the electoral count could be stopped. That's how the naming of Biden as the winner of the election could be technically stopped. John Eastman is the one who laid out the memo for how the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, which did stop the counting process for some time, he laid out the memo for how the attack on the Capitol that day could work. Particularly if Pence went along with it, this is how it could work. Well, today, bizarrely, that lawyer, John Eastman, the guy who wrote out this quasi-legal theory of the case, which they used to justify Republican members of Congress objecting to the electoral count, which they used to try to get Mike Pence to go along with this scheme. Today, in an interview with the National Review, that lawyer, John Eastman, sort of walked it all back. He didn't say he changed his mind. He said that was never what he meant in the first place. He tried to pretend that he didn't really write what he wrote in his memo. He's denying that he meant it. He now says it was just a draft. And of course, if anybody had gone along with any of this, that would be crazy, <laughs> which is insane, but also in its own way is progress, right? It would be a worse scenario if the people who tried to lay out this quasi-legal theory for how Trump could have stayed in power, if they were still defending that and saying that was the way that elections and post-election behavior should proceed in, in, in future years. Instead, it is progress. It is a form of accountability to see the lawyer who propounded that in writing saying, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. It must be a different John Eastman. By now, you've seen the headlines. Yesterday, on the set of a Western filming in New Mexico, the actor Alec Baldwin fired a gun that was supposed to be a prop in a scene. The resulting shot killed the film's cinematographer. A 42-year-old woman named Helena Hutchins, she was considered to be a rising star in her field. Again, she was the cinematographer. The film's director was also injured in this incident. He has since been released from the hospital. But when it comes to figuring out how this could have happened, the questions that come to the fore are sort of both simple and mystifying, right? How does a prop gun result in a real shooting? In some cases, a prop gun is, is literally something that's not a gun at all. It has no working parts. It's something just made out of rubber or plastic that's just designed to have a gun shape. But if you're watching a movie or a TV show and you see somebody actually fire a weapon, you hear the bang, you see the flash, chances are that is either special effects or that could be a real gun firing a blank bullet. Now, what's a blank bullet? Uh, this is a diagram that USA Today posted today, which I think is useful. Um, for an actual piece of ammunition, one that's designed to, you know, shoot someone, um, there's several parts. There's the casing, the primer, the powder, gunpowder, uh, and the bullet, which is at the tip of the projectile. That's the thing that's supposed to be able to kill you, right? The primer and the powder are the things that make the, gullet, the, the, the bullet propel out of the gun. That's the stuff that goes bang and lets off the flash. But it's the bullet that is the actual projectile that's fired out the, out the end of the barrel. Now, if a gun is loaded with a blank, that just means it has all those other component pieces that a real piece of ammunition has, minus the bullet itself, minus the projectile that's designed to actually kill you. Um, just because they're blanks, though, doesn't mean they're not dangerous. I mean... Go back to that diagram showing the blank for a second. Can we put that back up? You see where it says wad sealed with plastic or paper released like a projectile. There isn't a chunk of metal on the end, a bullet, but you do still need to stick something in there to seal in the gunpowder. And typically blanks use paper or plastic wadding that obviously has, you know, poses less danger than a bullet. But if fired at close enough range, even a blank can seriously injure or even kill someone. 
right? It's technically missing the bullet, but even a blank can be dangerous. Even a blank can be deadly. That's happened on movie sets before. These things are so dangerous that a lot of productions don't even use them at all anymore. You know the show, the, the show Mayor of Easttown? That was on HBO earlier this year. It was so good. Um, Kate Winslet plays the police detective. This is not a spoiler, but a lot of guns are fired on that show. Um, Kate Winslet's a cop. And on Mayor of Easttown for that whole show, they decided that every firing of every gun would all be CGI. It was all special effects. They didn't use prop guns loaded with blanks. They, you know, maybe lost the authentic recoil and the live muzzle flash that they would have gotten from using blanks, but they decided it wasn't worth the risk. They had it all the, they added in all of those effects after the fact. And a lot of productions do that now. But a lot of movie and TV sets still do use real guns. The prop master who handles all props for all purposes on the set, if there are guns being used, that person can sometimes be assisted by a specialist, an armorer, somebody who specializes in in weaponry for film and TV sets. Now, as you can imagine, the entertainment industry has really strict rules for using firearms on set. Um, This is some of the, from the Industry-Wide Labor Management Safety Commission. These are some of the safety bulletins they've put out about guns on set. Look at what this one says right right at the top in all capital letters. Blanks can kill. Treat all firearms as though they are loaded. And then it's just pages and pages of rules trying to head off any tragic accidents like the one that we saw yesterday in New Mexico. Number one, refrain from pointing a firearm at anyone, including yourself. If it is absolutely necessary to do so on camera, consult the prop master. Number two, never place your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Keep your finger alongside the firearm and off the trigger. Number three, know where and what your intended target is. This goes on and on and on. And to state the the very obvious, clearly something broke down on this film set yesterday in New Mexico when a crew member was killed and another seriously injured when an actor discharged a prop gun. And we don't know where the breakdown of safety protocols occurred, but how did it how could it have happened? Still lots of unanswered questions here, but joining us now is Steve Wolf. He is a weapon safety expert for films. He was involved in the investigation of the accidental shooting death of Brandon Lee uh, during a movie shoot back in 1993. Mr. Wolf, it's a real pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Rachel, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And I, I almost feel like you don't need me here. You've really got this. Well, let me ask you if I've explained any of this wrong. When I was talking about blanks and the differences no, you... between blanks and bullets, that was all the way it's supposed to be explained? You, you, you nailed it. Uh, you, you could have done, you know, 10 times the job that was done on the Baldwin set. Oh, well, let me ask you about this. this. I mean, I'm very, tr- I'm very, I'm very, oh, here, go ahead. So this is the casing. This is, this would be a blank round, just a casing and room for some gunpowder. And this is live ammo, the kind that you use to, to shoot at things. So hard to just, you know, hard to get these long, which is which. Um, one issue, though, has is been referring to this weapon as a prop weapon. A, a prop is anything that an actor touches. An actor touches their cell phone, you know, you know, this is a prop. Well, if I touch this gun, it's a prop. That doesn't make it a prop gun, though. It's, it's a gun that's being used as a prop. A prop gun has been mechanically modified so that you cannot introduce live ammo to it. Live ammo simply, sorry about that, live ammo simply won't go in to a prop gun. Only blanks will go in. So it's not that they were killed with a, that, that, you know, he was killed with a prop gun. He was killed with a real gun. And presumably now what we're hearing is, you know, with actual live ammo. Also, when we say going live on set, as you said, um, going live doesn't mean that we're using live ammo. It means that we're about to do something noisy, that we're really doing the real thing. You know, we're going to, we're going live. We're going to blow up the car. We're going live. We're loading the gun with the blanks. You know, it doesn't mean that we're putting real ammunition with bullets into guns that are capable of firing them and then, you know, handling them on set. Steve, because of all of the safety protocols that are used, including, as you just described, like making sure that you're using a realistic looking weapon that is operable, but it can't be loaded with live ammunition. The kind of safety rules that I just showed that are standard in terms of um, what people are, how people are trained to work around these kinds of um, firearms on set because of what we know about the sort of industry standards around safety briefings for everybody involved in a shoot that's got a, that's got a firearm involved in it in any way. 
it just seems very surprising, given the current state of how these things are handled in the industry, that this could happen. It seems like there's so many safeguards, this should be impossible. Yes. It's to the point where you, you can't hurt somebody by breaking a rule. You can hurt someone when you break multiple rules. So when you use an unmodified firearm that can accept live ammo, when you put that live ammo in it, when you point the gun at a person, you've now broken three rules that mm -hmm. lead you down the, the road towards accidental homicides. Any one of these things, you know, if, if, let's say you brought a live gun and put real ammo in it, but when you pointed it, you observed the rule that we don't point guns at things we don't want to see holes in, there wouldn't have been a fatality. You know, a bullet would go whizzing past everyone's head. Everyone's like, oh my God, this is an unsafe set and I'm leaving. But no one would have been killed. So you have to break a, a bunch of rules. Also, the, the, the talk about the gun misfiring. When a gun misfires, it doesn't go off. So the gun didn't misfire in the previous days. It was accidentally discharged. And I'm not sure how it's an accident. You know, having had guns around my whole life, I've never seen a gun go off by itself. Guns go off when you, I'm going to check that it's clear. Guns go off when you press the trigger. This is an intentional act. And so we shouldn't confuse intentional acts from accidents. The gun didn't accidentally go off. The gun was put in the hands of a person. The person did not check if there was anything in it. And then they pressed the trigger twice. That's why the gun went off. Hmm. So it's, it was why a matter of unsafe handling and unsafe supervision. Sort of, to me, shocking, definitely bizarre collapse of a Republican and conservative media scheme in the state of Nevada to promote false allegations of fraud in the presidential election in the state of Nevada. This is an amazing story. All right. Joe Biden beat Donald Trump in Nevada by just under 34,000 votes. Nevada is one of the states where Trump nevertheless sued to have the results overturned, to have himself declared the winner. He sued to have the results decertified. He actually asked the courts to just declare him the winner, even though the certified vote total said that Biden won. The reason he said that the election should be overturned and he should be declared the winner is because he said the Republican Party and the Trump campaign knew that there was so much fraud in the Nevada election. Specifically, they alleged that there were tons and tons of dead people who voted in Nevada, which means live people voted in dead people's names. You can't do that. They said they had tons of proof of that. Now, Republicans and the conservative media specifically hyped the case of one ballot that was cast in Nevada in the name of a woman who died in, a, in, in 2017 at the age of 52. A very sad story. She died of breast cancer. Um, she's been dead since 2017. Her address was apparently nevertheless mailed a ballot in her name. But her husband says he never saw any such ballot. No such ballot ever arrived. But the county, Clark County, Nevada, where he and his former and his late wife live, he says that the county nevertheless recorded her vote as having been cast and counted. Right? Fraud, voter fraud. Conservative and Republican groups held a big press conference in Nevada the week after the election, saying that this case proved that the election in Nevada was lousy with voter fraud. Sure, there was just this one example they had to talk about, but surely if there was this clear case of a, a ballot being cast and counted from this woman who was dead, then yeah, there must be hundreds, there must be thousands. The whole election in Nevada must be thrown out for all the dead people voters. Look at this one case. It is clearly an exemplar of what must be many, many, many of these cases. They held that big press conference about it, very well attended, very well covered in the media. Um, and then in the national media over on the Fox News channel, they went sort of hog wild with it. So was there voter fraud last week? That's a question we've been working on since election night. We've tried to be careful and precise as we report this out. In moments like this, truth really matters more than ever. False allegations of fraud can cause as much damage as the fraud itself. And the last thing America needs right now is more damage. So we want to be accurate. What we're about to tell you is accurate. It's not a theory. It happened and we can prove it. Other news organizations could prove it too. They've simply chosen not to a former elementary school teacher called Rosemary Hartle. 
According to her 2017 obituary, Rosemary Hartle was a loving, fun, sassy, and sarcastic in a fun way. Beautiful, powerful, relentless, and inspiring. Sadly, now she's gone. But her voter registration remains. She's still on the rolls. Someone received Rosemary Hartle's ballot in the mail and then cast it. Who did this? We don't know who did it. We wish we did. We should know. It's fraud. It's a threat to our system. And it's being hidden by a news media totally vested in a Joe Biden presidency. Again, we have a right to know. We have an obligation to know much more about this. Again, that case being used to tell Americans writ large whatever you've heard about voter fraud in the election, about there being massive fraud in the election, this case proves it. I mean, no doubt excited by the kind of press they were getting on the Fox News channel on this one. The Nevada State Republican Party just hyped this individual case relentlessly. They hyped this over and over again as all the evidence you need that there must have been tons of fraud in the election, that the whole Nevada election should be thrown out that Biden definitely didn't win, because look at this woman's case. That hyping by the state Republican Party in Nevada included this sort of morbid tweet in which they actually posted the woman's obituary alongside their statement. Kirk was surprised to find that his late wife, Rosemary, a Republican, cast a ballot in this year's election despite having passed away in 2017. The media needs to understand we are finding concrete cases of voter irregularities that they must expose. And again, they show the screenshot of the woman's obituary, scolding the media on this. In another one of their tweets, they you know, hyping the same case, they link to a video of Kirk, of the woman's husband, in this case, speaking with the local CBS station in Clark County, Nevada. It was uh, disbelief. Just it, it made no sense to me, but it lent lent some credence to the you know what you've been hearing in the media and you know, about these possibilities. And now it makes me wonder, you know, how pervasive is this? He was shocked. Disbelief. It just made no sense to me. Shocked to find out that a ballot had been cast in his dead wife's name. Shocked. It made no sense. But now that he knows it happened, he just went there. This obviously lends credence to all these claims you're hearing about, about all the voter fraud in the election. There must be tons of it. It Just makes me wonder how pervasive all this is. Well, now that man, the husband, has just been charged with two felony counts of voter fraud. Because according to prosecutors, according to Nevada State Attorney General's Criminal Prosecution Division, he's actually the one who cast the ballot in the name of his dead wife, in addition to his own ballot. Which means if the prosecutors in this case are correct, he probably wasn't all that shocked. Shocked and in disbelief to learn that her ballot had been cast since he's the one who cast it. But he nevertheless put himself out there to become the poster boy for these false claims of fraud that Republicans and the conservative media used and are still using to claim that the election was stolen. He's an executive at a company that had taken a very positive and public pro-Trump stance and had actually hosted an event for President Trump in Nevada just before the November election last year. He's been charged with these two felony counts. He's facing up to eight years in prison. He'll have his initial court appearance next month in Nevada. Also in Wisconsin, a totally separate audit carried out legitimately by the professional, qualified, nonpartisan Legislative Audit Bureau in Wisconsin. Today, that actually real audit conducted by people who know how to do audits, for whom that is their actual professional responsibility within the state. Today, they submitted their findings of a real audit, a real review they did of how the election went in Wisconsin this year, uh, this past year. And it turns out in their findings, again, their professional, qualified, sober, nonpartisan findings, what they found was actually everything was fine. Here's the, here's the Associated Press on that today in Wisconsin. You see the headline there, Wisconsin audit finds elections are safe and secure. Here's the lead. A highly anticipated nonpartisan audit of the 2020 presidential election in Wisconsin released today did not identify any widespread fraud in the battleground state, which a key Republican legislative leader said shows Wisconsin's elections are, quote, safe and secure. So, yes, Republicans in Wisconsin are persisting with their clown show audit. But it's now being forced to go through some hoops 
set by um, potentially by by the courts in Wisconsin, which is probably a good thing. Rationalizing that process, opening it up to public scrutiny, not letting them just do whatever they want and call it an investigation. And simultaneously, today also, they were forced to admit after a real audit that actually everything was fine with the election results there. (laughs) 